11 o'clock and we'll get started. My name is Mary Dojois and I work with the Massachusetts Department of Labor Standards. And with me today is Maxine Garbo, who also does uh, bloodborne pathogen training uh, throughout the state. And this webinar right now is designed for non-healthcare workers. Um, some folks in the cities and towns and in state agencies have mentioned that they have been finding uh, discarded syringes um, and they need some help with a safety program in um, picking those up correctly. So this webinar is designed specifically for those um, employees who are assigned to that task and who normally do not do healthcare work. Okay, there's three main things that I'd like you to learn from this training. First is how to clean up discarded syringes. Second is to learn about uh, the types of viruses that could be in a contaminated syringe. So we'll talk a little bit about HIV and hepatitis. And we're only going to talk briefly about it. If you are a healthcare worker and you work in a medical office, a hospital or a dentist office, or you're an EMT, uh, some of your training will be a little bit more extensive. This will be a brief overview um, for non-healthcare workers. And third, um, let's talk about worst case. If you do get a needle stick, let's plan ahead what we're going to do. Okay, and meanwhile, in this webinar, we do have a chat box. And you can type in any questions you might have, and Maxine is here um, to give you an answer um, in writing, or uh, we might shout out that question to the group. All right, so let's talk about OSHA standards. Uh, and the first question you might have is, do I have to follow OSHA standards? And the answer is yes. So um, in Massachusetts, municipal, county, and state employees are covered by Mass General Law, Chapter 149, Section 6, and 6 and a half, which require employers to prevent work-related injury. If you work for a state agency, you may recall back in March, uh, a new law went into effect which requires state agencies to follow OSHA regulations. And that OSHA regulation is the OSHA Bloodborne Pathogen Standard. It's got a tagline here. It's called 29 CFR. 1910.1030. And so this training webinar here is uh, designed to be to put you in compliance with that OSHA. Okay, so here's section one. Let's talk about cleaning up syringes safely. Your workplace needs to have a few things up front. So up front, your department should have a written program, and in the handout section, I have a written, in the handout section way over here on the right, I do have a sample program for you. Uh, your workplace is going to need uh, some tools to collect those syringes. You're going to need a sharps disposal container. You're going to need gloves for your workers. You're going to need to offer those workers the hepatitis B vaccine, and you're going to have to provide them with training. Okay, if the handout section doesn't work over here for the sample bloodborne pathogen program, we also have it posted on our website. Okay, who can be assigned to clean up discarded syringes? So it can be anyone who works in your department, uh, but first, a few things have to be done. So the worker needs to be provided with the right tool, needs to be given a sharp disposal container, needs to be given gloves, needs to be offered the hepatitis B vaccine, and needs to be trained in bloodborne pathogens. So I will be talking about the hep B vaccine um, halfway through the presentation. Step one for handling discarded syringes is a concept called universal precautions. And that means that we assume that all used syringes are contaminated with HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. Just like when you go to your own dentist and when you go to your own doctor, they use universal precautions. They assume that each patient is infectious for a bloodborne pathogen.
Step two, we're going to wear a puncture-resistant glove. So the next three or four slides are going to talk about gloves and how to, how to choose them and uh, places to buy them. So over on the left here whoops, is a picture of someone wearing a traditional latex healthcare glove. And for our task of going out to um, cities and towns where we find discarded syringes, we are not going to wear this healthcare glove. And the reason why is because the healthcare glove is not puncture resistant. A needle tip can go right through that glove. We are also not expecting a lot of liquid blood contact. We're not expecting to get our hands wet with blood. So what we're going to do, instead of using the glove that we normally see at a doctor or dentist office, we're going to use a puncture resistant glove. Something that if perchance that needle tip does scratch against my hand, I will be wearing a thicker glove that has an, a chance to resist that glove. So let's talk about the types of puncture resistant gloves. Whoops. Looks like I don't have that. I'll have that in a few, sorry. All right. We are going to choose our personal protective equipment based on the tasks that we're doing. So here is one particular scenario that we might see. This is a picture inside a state agency, and there is a syringe located in the bathroom floor. And the blue arrow there points down to the floor. There is one syringe. Um, it's hard to see in the photo, but when you walk into the bathroom, you can see it. Your vision is not obstructed by leaves, um, trees, grass, other things. So the syringe tip is clearly visible. The personal protective equipment we're going to select for this task is going to be a puncture-resistant glove, and then we're going to use a pair of pliers to pick up that syringe. What I really want to do is I want to avoid hand contact. So I have an opportunity to get stuck by a syringe if I'm using my hand. So what I'm going to do as first is use a pair of pliers or a pick a picker tool so that I'm not using hand contact. And then, just as a backup redundancy, I will be wearing a pair of thicker puncture-resistant gloves in case something goes wrong. Okay, we have another scenario here. Uh, this is a picture of a bus stop where we have some cigarette butts, we have some leaf litter, and then we have some syringe litter. This type of scenario is a little bit more complicated than the bathroom floor. Um, so what we're also going to do first, we're going to avoid hand contact by using a pair of pliers or using a long-handled handled picker tool. And then we're going to use some puncture-resistant gloves. Okay, these gloves here are manufactured and actually go through a test system. So we've all heard of uh, safety glasses that are shatterproof and even windshield glass in your car. That gets a safety rating because it's actually put through a test where they uh, shoot a projectile at the safety glass and see if it punctures or not. These gloves that get a puncture rating are tested in a very similar way. They take a um, nail tip and they put pounds of pressure on uh, the nail tip to see if they can puncture through those gloves. Here we have another even more complicated task that um, hopefully we're not running into very often. But we have a scenario here where there's lots of debris. We have food wrappers. We have um, lots and lots of needles. Okay. So here what we want to do in this situation uh, is we're going to avoid hand contact again by using a picker tool. I'm going to protect my hands by using puncture-resistant gloves. But due to the amount of material that's on the floor here, I'm also going to protect my feet. If I'm wearing mesh sneakers and I drop a syringe, there is a chance that it could poke through that sneaker. So if I'm walking into a, a sort of a high-density situation here, I'm going to protect my feet 
um, by wearing a, an overboot that is uh, puncture resistant. Now, let's talk a, a second now about where to find those gloves and how to buy them. And I talked for a second about the glove ratings. So for instance, you can go to your current vendor that you use right now to buy equipment. You might be buying equipment from Granger or Fastenal or Fisher Scientific, anybody on the state vendor uh, list. You can continue to use that vendor. But when you open up that vendor catalog, I'll give you some tips here on what you're looking for. So your glove is going to have two ratings. One, the first rating that you'll see in the catalog is a cut resistant rating. And what they've done is they've tested that glove against something like um, an X-Acto knife, a sideways cutting motion. So someone who works in a deli or a butcher shop, someone who opens up these cardboard boxes, wants to be protected from a sideways cutting motion. Um, and that will have a cut resistant rating. The ratings are one, two, three, four, five. Five is the highest. Now some vendors, they do that cut resistant test and then that's it. They sell the glove to you. They don't do the next test. The, sec the next test is the puncture resistant test. They take uh, a nail head and they try to, they put pounds of pressure on it and they try to puncture that glove. The ratings are zero, one, two, three, and four. Four is the highest rating, which means that it took the most amount of force to puncture. So when you open up your catalog, the way the Granger is set out, you have to look for cut resistance first, and then you look for the one that's puncture resistant. Gloves that are puncture resistant will also also have a cut resistant rating because the Kevlar and the Aramid fibers um, often can do both, and the manufacturer is paying for both of those tests. So what we're looking for on, the, on that scenario uh, where we had the bus stop and there were a lot of syringes hidden in uh, cigarette butts and hidden in the leaves, we are going to look for a glove with a puncture rating that is four or five. And inside the glove will be a tag, and the tag will say, uh, well, this particular glove says, ANSI puncture four and ANSI cut three. So it means for a sideways motion, it has a level of three, which is fine. That's for um, picking up scrap metal. And it has a, pick, uh, a puncture rating of four right on that tag. The glove on the right is made from a different manufacturer but has also gone through a puncture test. Um, inside, well the label actually here on the outside tells us what the um, puncture rating is. Now when I first got these gloves because they sent me a sample, it's got this really nice orange coating on the outside and I thought that was the puncture resistant feature or fabric. And it's not true. The orange uh, plastic coating on the outside is just for grip. And the puncture resistant fabric is actually on the inside of the glove here. There is a pad sewn in to the palm of the glove to resist punctures. So there's different types of uh, gloves available that will do the job for us. Okay, step three is we need to have a sharps container. And we're going to put the sharps disposal container right on the ground near the, near the discarded syringe. We're going to open up the lid before we pick up the syringe. And we're going to make sure that we put that sharps container right on the ground. Um, I don't want to hold the sharps container in my left hand have a syringe in my right hand and go to put it into the sharps container, that's an opportunity for me to get stuck. All right, so here we have a photo of two workers in a cemetery who are looking for discarded syringes. Um, you'll notice that they are both wearing gloves. You'll notice that they have a long-handled picker tool, 
okay? And you'll notice that they have a sharps container. The fellow on the right has actually found a syringe. He has put the sharps container on the ground. He's opened the lid. He's using the picker tool to pick up the syringe, and then it will go right into the container. He will, it will, the syringe will never touch his hand. And so here's those steps. He's so what's very important here for us is to avoid hand contact. We want to pick up that syringe using a tool. And there's also some other features. We put the syringe immediately into the sharps container the same way that we found the sharp. So sometimes you might find a syringe that has a cap on it. Like over here, there's a syringe that has a cap on it. You're going to pick that up with your pair of pliers or your picker tool. You're going to put it right into the sharps container. We will not remove the cap. Over here on this side is a syringe that is missing a cap. That is OK. You're going to pick it up with your pair of pliers or your picker tool. You're going to put it right into the sharps container. You are not going to put the cap onto a syringe that's missing it, because that's just an it's unnecessary step, and it's an opportunity for you to get stuck with the needle. What's also important is to bring that sharps container out with you, bring it to the bathroom with you, bring it to the cemetery with you, bring it to the bus station with you. We don't want to pick up a syringe and walk back to your truck where the sharps container is. Bring the container with you to the location where the needle was found. And last, we're never going to hand a syringe to another person. Uh, that is an opportunity to get stuck. So you'll even notice in a hospital setting or a doctor's office, uh, or even in the dentist when they have to hand that, uh, the assistant hands a Novocaine needle to the dentist, they actually don't exchange that syringe hand to hand. They put it on a tray, and the next person picks it up from a flat surface. That is a uh, work practice technique to avoid a needle stick. OK, so a common question we get is, can I put other items in the sharps container? So you might find bottle cap, tin foil um, in the same area as the syringe. So there's two answers to that. Uh, so yes, you can put other things in the sharps container. It's not against the law. All right? However, we do discourage it. We want the bottle cap to be thrown in regular trash. We want a plastic baggie to be thrown in regular trash. Because if I put those items in the sharps container, it, makes, it takes up room. And it makes it harder for the next time you want to put another syringe in there. Uh, there might be some resistance. It's a little bit more bulky. Um, and we have had instances where there's so much other junk in a sharps container that when you go to put the next needle in, it falls back out onto someone's hand. So we want to avoid that. All right, so what works for uh, many cities and towns and state agencies is to have a pickup kit. And what you'll have in your caddy is you'll have the pliers, you'll have the gloves, You'll have the sharps container, and you'll have some hand sanitizer. And if someone reports a needle, you've got your kit that's ready to go. OK, after we picked up the needle, we were wearing gloves to pick up the needle, just as a worst case scenario to protect our hands. Um, but the OSHA regulation does require us to wash our hands after removing gloves. Now, if I'm out in the field, if I'm near a sink, great. I'm going to use soap and water. That is uh, the best first choice. But if I'm out in the field, uh, I was out in my pickup truck, uh, it is completely acceptable to use hand sanitizer. All right, so we have our first quiz. Workers who clean up discarded syringes should do which of the following? And here are our options. Assume all syringes are contaminated. Avoid hand contact with the syringe. Dispose immediately into a sharps disposal container.
Okay, so our answer is D, all of the above. So let's talk about types of Sharps containers. All of the Sharps containers uh, in this photo are acceptable. They have the following features. They are all puncture proof. So they're hard shell plastic. They're all leak proof. If I have something oozing, it's not going to leak out to the outside of that container. They all have a lid that can be closed in transit. And they should be labeled on the outside. I'll have that biohazard label, biohazard label um, that indicates that there's medical sharps inside. The type of container that you select depends on where you're finding your needles and how many needles you're finding. So if you work in a library and you've got a reception desk and you're seeing uh, a couple of syringes a month, this size over on the right, this smaller, container might be enough for you. However, if you're walking out to cities and parks or along train tracks to, and you're finding needles, you might find it very useful to have a container that has a handle. Handles can be useful. You also want a container when you go out into the field and you put it down on the grass, it's going to actually stay level for you. And so this container here uh, with the very wide mouth might be a good option. Uh, so there's lots of different vendors out there who sell these containers. Uh, you buy um, the price that works for you. And the color also, we're used to seeing red containers. They also sell them in yellow. They sell them in see-through. Um, there is no color requirement. Uh, it is just the requirement here is for the label. Any question on sharps containers, you can type that in and we'll try to answer it for you. All right, now once you've collected these sharps, how do we dispose of them properly to their final um, disposal site? So you may be familiar with a state law that says for um, household medical sharps, a law went into effect in 2008. Um, that if you use insulin syringes, um, vitamin B12 syringes in your household, um, you are not allowed to put them out with your regular trash. Uh, we've had sanitation collection workers get stuck when a needle goes through a, uh, a plastic trash bag. So since 2008, residents are required to put their needles into a um, hard shell plastic container for households. That could be an old food container like the Gatorade. Uh, it could be an old laundry detergent uh, bottle. And then they would bring it down uh, to some place in town to a central collections uh, site. Some police stations have this kiosk. Some boards of health have the kiosk. Some fire departments have the kiosk. Um, and in some towns, the local pharmacy uh, has a kiosk for residents. Uh, the state vendor list, FAC 82, has vendors that offer this service. What they will do is, whoops, go to the next slide. Now, since you are collecting these needles for work, you are not, at, the, at a workplace, you are not allowed to use an old laundry detergent bottle, and you are not allowed to use an old Gatorade bottle. You must use an official type hard shell, sharps container. In a particular town, uh, depending upon how many crews you have uh, collecting these needles, you might have uh, one kit, you might have five kits. So you'll need five sharps containers, one for each kit. Once this container gets filled, you'll have a storage closet somewhere in your department with a square cardboard container that is supplied from your vendor, and all of these uh, sharps containers will be put into that box. So this final disposal box, might you might have 20 sharps containers in here. So it might take a year to fill up that box. If you're in a hospital, it might take a week to fill up that box. Then your vendor, 
you can call you would call when the cardboard box gets filled you call your vendor for a pickup they will give you a waste manifest it will describe how many boxes they picked up when they picked it up and then they will tell you the location of the incinerator the medical incinerator that they took this to so it's sort of a, a cradle, cradle to grave manifest that shows that you disposed of those sharks correctly. And there are vendors on the state vendor list to uh, provide this service. Uh, they sell the sharks containers and they do the bulk pickup. And they are on that um, contract FAC 82. Over here on the, in the download section, we do have a handout on that state vendor guide. You can click on that. When it highlights blue, you can click on the download file button. All right, so let's talk about a scenario. Uh, in your town, you're working in a library, and a patron uh, comes up to the reception desk and reports that there's a needle in the bathroom. It is acceptable for this department to have a group of designated uh, persons who would be called as needed to pick up that needle. The designated person will uh, go and get that collection kit. They'll put on their gloves. They'll pick up the syringe with a pair of pliers. They'll put the syringe immediately into a sharps container. They'll bring that sharps container and the collection kit back to a storage area, and then they'll wash their hands. That will be um, the way the scenario runs. So a scenario two is a patron finds a, a needle in the bathroom, but then decides to be helpful and actually carries it to the front reception desk. So one option that this library could have is to keep a small sharps container at the desk. You would then reach down, put the sharps container on the top of the counter, and ask the patron to put the syringe directly into the container. At that point, the patron has done all the work, and the, li uh, the librarian has not touched the syringe at all. The second option is the patron still brings the needle to the reception desk, but at reception, we don't have a sharps container there. So what are you going to do? You'll ask the patron to put the syringe onto the top of the desk, onto a flat level surface. Then you'll call your designated person to bring the sharps container. They'll put on their gloves. They'll pick up the syringe with pliers. They'll put it into the sharps container, and they'll wash their hands. So at no point uh, was there hand-to-hand -hand exchange between the patron and one of your um, department work employees. The syringe was put onto a flat surface, and then the designated person picked up the syringe and put it into a container. That is something we might see. All right, another scenario we might see is that a resident in town uh, calls in and reports that they saw a syringe at a park or a bus station. So now, per your town's program, uh, you would contact one of the town's designated persons. And then the scenario runs the same way. The designated person will uh, go over to the site, put on their, bring their kit, put on the gloves, pick up the syringe with pliers, put the syringe immediately into the sharps container, bring the sharps container and the kit back to their uh, main storage area, and then wash their hands. OK, so that's the scenario of how to pick up uh, syringes. If you've got any questions, you can uh, type them in. The next part of uh, training requirement is to give a brief overview of the types of um, infectious diseases that might be present in blood that's inside a syringe. Okay, so the sources of blood-borne pathogens for our custodians, facility workers, park rec workers um, that are assigned to clean up these needles, uh, any type of wet blood, any type of dried blood, used syringes, used lancets, and used razors, all can be a source of blood-borne pathogens. 
Over on the right, though, there are some body fluids that are not considered blood-borne pathogens. So we have a list here of urine, vomit, spit, sweat, and sewage water. So all of those items are gross. All of those items could have bacteria and virus that could give me diarrhea, that could make me sick, that could give me the flu, but they are not blood-borne pathogens. They will not have H. They will not be uh, infectious for HIV or hepatitis B or C. Uh, sometimes in these items there is a small amount of those viruses, but there has not been transmission. Okay, so what is hepatitis? Hepatitis is sort of a fancy word, and it means liver. So you may have heard of hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E. They're different viruses, but they all attack the liver. The illness can cause a short-term illness, sort of like the flu. And for some people, not all, it can become a chronic illness. So the flu-like illness in the beginning, you might have fatigue, lack of appetite, dark urine, nausea, vomiting. It's very similar to the flu. So hepatitis B and hepatitis C are similar in that they attack the liver, but then they're also different. Um, so hepatitis B, 5 to 10 percent of people become long-term carriers. And hepatitis C is a little bit more serious. Um, 55 to 85 percent become long-term carriers. A long-term carrier means that after you have that initial flu-like illness, you feel like your body goes back to normal. You don't have any symptoms anymore, uh, but you are a, a background carrier that can be contagious to other people. It is still affecting your liver through some inflammation. And after 20 to 30 years, you might have a more serious liver illness and symptoms develop. So the good news about hepatitis B is that a vaccine is available. And that's why OSHA makes it mandatory that the vaccine is offered to all workers who might be at risk of contact with blood or might be at risk of needle stick. The hepatitis B vaccine has been out for a long time, more than 20 years, and even now to get into grade school, elementary school, um, most kids have to be vaccinated with hepatitis B. Hepatitis C is the more serious of the illness as far as uh, becoming chronic carriers, and there is no vaccine at this time. However, we have some exciting news in 2012 that there's new medicine available now to treat hepatitis C. However, it is very expensive. It's effective, it's working, but it's an expensive drug. So our, what we want to do is avoid those needle sticks. The other type of uh, virus that can be in blood is the HIV virus. And it's a virus that attacks the immune system. And we need our immune system. We've got our lymph nodes. We've got our white blood cells. Uh, when we get the common cold, when we get the flu, it's our white blood cells that go uh, into attack and protect us. Um, HIV uh, attacks those white blood cells. And it makes it harder for us to fight off um, other illnesses. So HIV works in a similar way as hepatitis, and even works a similar way as chickenpox. There is an incubation period. But during the incubation period, you don't feel anything. At the end of incubation, you break out with um, an illness. And it's just like hepatitis. You've got something that feels like the flu again. Uh, you've got fever, nausea, fatigue. Some folks can get a rash. You might have enlarged lymph nodes, and you might have a sore throat. 
a lot of people with those symptoms think that they have the cold or flu. Uh, they may not think that they've been exposed to HIV. But after this initial illness is over, uh, you, your body might sort of bounce back, um, and people will not have uh, showing outward symptoms. But all people who have that acute illness and get that HIV um, infection, that all people right now do become chronic carriers. There is medicine to treat. Without medicine, the HIV infection can progress to AIDS illness within 10 years. But right now with the medicines, and the medicines are improved every year, uh, persons with HIV infection can live 30-plus uh, years and more. Um, and so it's managing the illness sort of like managing diabetes. Uh, but on the outside, most people will not look sick at all. All right. So I have this little quiz. Um, think about these questions to yourself, and then we'll talk about the answers. First question, air kills HIV. Second question, HIV dies when it is outside the body. How do we feel about those, true or false? So let's talk about the answers. Air kills HIV, that is false. Air kills hepatitis, that is false. So if I have um, someone with a bloody nose and they get blood on a sink or a tabletop, uh, air does not kill the viruses in that blood. Uh, we do need a disinfectant to clean up um, the blood spill from that bloody nose. The next question was, HIV dies when it is outside the body. So that is false. And I have a picture of a um, blood donation uh, packet there that uh, gets stuck into a fridge and uh, waits for uh, when someone needs that blood donation. Uh, those viruses are, can still be viable when they are outside the body, and the viruses can still be viable when they are below body temperature. So why do I have this quiz? It's just to remind you that if you do have a, a liquid blood spill, that you do need a, a registered disinfectant to clean that up. And also just to remind you that uh, if you're handling that syringe and it's been out, um, the blood in that syringe can still be viable for illnesses. Okay, step three is what to do if we get a needle stick. First, before we, uh, the needle stick ever happens, workers who are assigned to clean up these syringes must be offered the hepatitis B vaccine. If you've already had the vaccine in the past, you may decline that vaccine. And your answer is, I already have the vaccine. I don't want to get it again. That is perfectly fine. And we actually, if you've already had it once, you're done. You do not need to get it again. The CDC does not recommend a booster uh, for hepatitis B at this time. So what should I do if I get a needle stick? First thing we want to do is wash that area with soap and water. Soap and water, soap and water. Do not add a disinfectant to your skin. Do not add bleach to your skin. And there is a, there is a reason why. Um, HIV and hepatitis are transmitted more easily through damaged skin. Uh, and bleach and disinfectant will damage your skin. So we don't want to damage your skin. We want to keep your skin healthy. So we only wash with soap and water. This is the same protocol that they use in hospitals. Uh, when they get a needle stick, they wash with soap and water. The next thing we need to do is you need to get a medical exam within 24 hours. So if you are stuck by a needle, you are actually almost done now for the day. You need to notify your supervisor immediately. Do not wait for the end of your shift. And we want you to go to a healthcare provider 
before the end of your shift. And so right now, in far, as far as the pre-planning stage, your human resources department should pre-select an occupational health provider where uh, we will send employees if they have a needle stick. Uh, and on the weekend and, and afternoon, second shift, uh, go to an emergency room. Now, some people might ask, can I use my personal doctor? And so we will say, uh, you can call your personal doctor, let them know what happened. We do encourage you, though, to use an occupational health provider or an emergency room, and there's a reason. The reason is we want you to go to a doctor who sees a lot of needle sticks each month. So they see them on a weekly basis and a monthly basis. They are current with the most current uh, treatment recommendations. There are a lot of personal doctors who have actually haven't seen a needle stick in 10 years. We don't want you to get information that's 10 years old. We want you to get information that's current for today. So you're welcome to call your personal doctor, let them know what happened, uh, and they can also uh, coordinate and work with the occupational health doc and work with the ER. Something to know is that medical exam is confidential. So if I get a needle stick and I get tested for HIV and hepatitis as a background, that information is not shared with my boss. It is not shared with my employer. Now because the needle stick happened during work time, my work might get a bill from the ER. Here is the $45 bill for my hepatitis test. But there are no results revealed, only to me. A common question we get is, should I bring that syringe to the doctor? And the answer is no. Uh, there's not enough blood inside to actually run those tests for HIV or hepatitis. Um, so bringing the syringe uh, is not requested at this time. A lot of people in the back of their mind are going to have uh, a primary question. And their main question is, um, after a needle stick, am I going to catch HIV or hepatitis? And the answer depends on three things. How much virus was in the blood to begin with? If there was no virus in the blood, then you, will, you cannot catch the virus. The second thing it depends on is the type of needle that was involved. So a uh, lancet or a scalpel that causes this scratch over on the left will be at lower risk. It's not a deep puncture. We'll be, but over here on the right, um, getting a deep puncture with a uh, syringe-type needle that had blood on it would be at a higher risk. So if I, when I go to the doctor, what's going to happen? So the healthcare provider is going to make an assessment. So they will ask you questions about the type of Sharps device that was involved. They'll ask you about the type of puncture. And then they'll make a recommendation. They might recommend medicine, but not always. They might ask to take baseline blood tests. And they might ask you to return in a few months for follow-up. Uh, that, that is a pretty typical scenario. If they do recommend medicine, it has a name called post-exposure prophylaxis. Years ago, uh, well, years ago, the, the drugs were slightly different. So since 2012, in the past three years, the recipe for those drugs has changed, uh, and there are less side effects. So um, after a needle stick, there are when an EMT got a needle stick in the past, uh, and they took these medicines. Sometimes they would report that they were nauseous, uh, dizzy, um, and weren't feeling so well from the side effects. Uh, there are less side effects now. Um, 
And so hopefully that is good news. So a common question we also get is, okay, someone found a syringe on the bathroom floor, they picked it up and they brought it to the reception desk. Uh, do I need to go to the doctor if I touch the syringe with my bare hands? And the answer is no. You only need to go to the doctor if you actually had a puncture, okay? So in, in our, this webinar is really dealing with needle sticks, so if you had a puncture from a needle stick. An EMT would only go to the doctor if they had a needle stick or if they had a splash to their eyes, nose, or mouth uh, with someone's blood or body fluid. What you should do after touching a syringe with your bare hand uh, is wash your hands. Okay, so here's our, uh, another quiz. A worker who gets cut or stuck by a used syringe should do which of the following? Here are our options. A, wash the area immediately with soap and water. B, tell their supervisor immediately. C, obtain a medical exam before the end of the shift. D, be able to describe the type of cut or needle stick to the healthcare provider. And E, all of the above. Okay, so our answer is E, all of the above. If you have any questions on that answer, you can type in your questions. Okay, for managers in the room who are, who are going to have workers assigned to needle pickup, there's a few things your department needs to have in place. One is a written program. Two is the gloves must be available. Three, you must have the tools like uh, pliers, pickers, and sharps containers. We need to offer the Hep C vaccine. We need to pre-plan where we're going to send our workers if there's a needle stick. And we have to provide the training on bloodborne pathogens. And this webinar qualifies for that. Over in the right-hand side here for the in the download file section, we do have um, a copy of today's webinar. We have a sample written program. If you fill in the, if you read that program, fill in the blanks, do everything that it says you should do in that program, you will be, um, you will have a program that complies with the OSHA requirements. We also here have a handout on the state vendor guide for finding a sharps container. Okay, so if you have, that wraps up our webinar. If you have any questions, you can type them into the chat box. You can send your questions to our website, or we have an email hotline at safepublicworkplace at state.ma.us. And we also have a phone number. This is our main line, 508-616-0461. And you can ask to speak to someone on the public sector program. So thank you, everyone, for logging in. And our webinar is done.